Well, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Andy Ellis. I'm director of Arch UK. Um, before I introduce Mary and Jeremy, um, I'd like to welcome all our guests who are joining us tonight. Um, we've got a very large um, group of guests joining us um, from around the world. Indeed, uh, we have guests from um, 14 countries around the world as well as across the UK. So really wonderful to have you all joining us tonight. Um, as you can see, we're using Zoom webinar. That means you can pour another glass of wine, open a very noisy, crunchy, munchy uh, pack of uh, mini cheddars, make a lot of noise and no one will hear you. The conversation will last around 35 to 40 minutes. You can pose questions on the Q&A as we proceed. Um, those will accumulate and I will then pose those questions to, to Jeremy and Mary um, at the end of um, the, the event. And we aim to finish at um, around seven o'clock. And if you would like to use the, the captions as a CC button at the bottom of the screen, so please just click on, on that. I suspect um, everyone on this call is, is familiar with, with Art UK. Um, in short, our work, uh, revolves around democratizing access to the nation's art collection. Um, but here I just want to dwell just for a few minutes on the sculpture project because this two-day conference um, of which this event is, is, is part marks the culmination this year of an extraordinary uh, project. Indeed it's interesting that um, it was just a few feet from here in my kitchen that um, in 2012, a number of my colleagues and, and I um, came together for, for, for dinner to, to talk about what would follow the big oil painting digitization project we were just about to finish, would have taken us 10 years or so. Would we move on to do watercolors? Would it be prints? And as it happened, we decided in the end, it would be sculpture, sculpture of the last thousand years. Um, little did we know in 2012 it would take us over four years to, to fund that project. Uh, the project started in 2017 and as I said it finishes this year. So over the next few months um, over 50,000 uh, sculptures from within uh, public collections from museums and other public institutions will join the site. And then by um, the autumn of this year, some 15,000 public sculptures outdoors, the subject of um, tonight's conversation, they will also join the Art UK website. And um, given the intense interest in public sculpture at the moment, the timing could not be, could not be better. This will have been the biggest sculpture cataloging exercise ever undertaken in the United Kingdom. Um, it will have immeasurable impact on the study and awareness of sculpture and hopefully also the enjoyment of sculpture. Telling the stories behind those objects is already something we're starting to do on the UK but will be very much the focus for us over the next few years as will embedding uh, sculpture into our learning resources um, building on the extraordinary learning engagement activities that have been part of this project, um, including making films with young people about sculpture, taking great sculptures into schools through our Masterpieces in Schools program. This has been a very significant undertaking. Um, in total, some hundred uh, members of staff and freelancers have been involved. Um, some 500 volunteers have been involved, many taking photographs of the outdoor sculptures. Uh, but it's also a project that um, has involved working with partners, um, including the PMSA, the BBC, the Royal Society of Sculptors, uh, the Royal Photographic Society, uh, Vocalize, Culture Street, and the Factum Foundation. In addition, we've worked with hundreds of collections up and down the country and with thousands, thousands of artists uh, working with them to, to receive their copyright um, consent to, to reproduce their, their works online. 
Of course, none of this would have been possible without our funders. Um, so in total, we needed to raise 3.8 million. The National Lottery uh, gave us 2.8 million. Um, and once that funding was agreed, I have to say they've been the most brilliant partners, absolutely fantastic to, to work with. And um, I think we owe them a, a debt of gratitude because it was very much their thinking to make engagement and learning a key part of this project um, before the funding was agreed. And I think that has been so, so very important. Um, in addition, we had to raise another million pounds of match funding. Uh, that came from Arts Council, from the Scottish Government, Esme Fairbairn, Stavros Niarchos, uh, Henry Moore Foundation, and, and the Garfield Weston Foundation. In total, over 90 um, institutions and um, members of the public contributed to that fundraising, many of whom are on this call tonight. So a massive thank you to you. As I've indicated, um, this has involved so many, many colleagues and um, who have worked so brilliantly on this. Um, but I would like to just draw attention to just one particular colleague uh, tonight, uh, Katie Goodwin, our Deputy Director, who was there at that dinner many, many years ago when we decided what we were going to move on to do. Um, Katie led the fundraising. Um, she has led the project and indeed she's arranged this, this, this conference. Um, she's um, managed what has been an extraordinarily complex project with aplomb, um, assured professionalism, calmness and, and, and great charm. So a, to you, Katie, a, a, an enormous thank you from, from all of us for everything you've done on this. So without further ado, let's um, move on to um, tonight's conversation between Mary Beard and Jeremy Della, who are going to share their thoughts about uh, the role of art and, and sculpture in public places at this time of great interest in public sculpture across the United Kingdom. So let me start with, with Jeremy, uh, one of our best known artists, described very recently on, on, a, on a front row interview, a wonderful front row interview with Jeremy as an alchemist of unexpected combinations. He won the Turner Prize in 2004, was behind the remarkable, we're here because we're here in 2016. And I think we should, of course, add who's in the winning team um, at the Courtauld in the Christmas University Challenge. So Jeremy, very, very warm welcome to you. And um, of course, Mary Beard, um, country's best known classicist, uh, <laughs> um, professor at the University of Cambridge. Mary is an author and broadcaster and most importantly for Art UK tonight, she is our patron this year. So over to you, Mary, and um, you're going to start off the conversation. I hope we're all um, properly unmuted. Uh, uh, Jeremy and I last came face to face in the summer um, at Stonehenge, uh, rather bizarrely. So this, this virtual meeting is a, a, a bittersweet memory of um, when you could um, travel the country previously, and we hope we will do again. But I, I wanted to kick this discussion off by, by being completely honest and saying, you know, public sculpture came very much into the popular arena with um, what happened to the sculpture of Colston in Bristol. And when I watched the toppling of Colston, I have to say that I felt quite excited. I felt, um, I, I felt something was happening. Somebody was taking notice of something. I thought it was in a, a funny way, a good moment, um, you know, even though I kind of occasionally masquerade as an art historian. I, I wondered what Jeremy thought uh, about watching that footage. I think we, well, we're both art historians. I agree with you. I mean, a sculpture itself, a statue, it wasn't necessarily even an artwork. That's something we might want to talk about. But I thought the way it was taken down and put into the, the dock was actually a very poetic gesture or act. And I'm actually quite interested to see what the, how it will be displayed in the museum later, if they'll keep all the marks from that or they'll try and restore it in some way. I hope they don't, because mm. that's, 
that's part of the ongoing story yeah. about that statue, yeah. really. Yeah. So yes, I thought it was quite satisfying in a way. And, and like, you're right, maybe we shouldn't be saying that, but for that sort of iconoclasm, but it, I, I just thought it, was, it made sense. Yeah, yeah. I, I've been told that it will keep all its marks and that it will be displayed lying down, not standing up, but we shall, yeah. we shall see. Uh, what, what I felt much more kind of gloomy about, though, was not that moment, which was for me very, you know, it was exciting because it was somehow it was a real moment about about a, a work of art, however you want to call it, in the public domain. I felt that the discussions about statues that have followed that moment have been much less um, uplifting, have been rather crude and have come down to, I, I think, very sort of disappointing polarisations between, um, uh, you know, the statue upholders, the statue files, you know, in Greek terms, and, you know, the enemies of statues in a way that has got us almost nowhere, really, in thinking about this. Yes, I think you're right. It became politicised, even though that was a political act in itself to do that to Colston. But it, it did become very quickly politicised, probably because the, the government took a very quick and very sort of definite position on it. I actually went to one of the um, Protect the Sculptures, Protect the Statues, sorry, events mm. in Trafalgar Square, uh, in Parliament Square, which was a very strange event because mm. it, was, it was about... 3,000 men mainly standing around waiting for something to happen, which didn't. It was quite an ugly atmosphere. There's actually a photograph. Can you put up Gandhi, please? We've, we're, Michael is doing our images for us. So <laughs> here, let's talk to Michael, he's doing the images. It was a quite a strange event because nothing really was happening. Um, and there we, but what was happening, what did happen was that Gandhi and Nelson Mandela were covered up for a Protect the Statues event because I think they felt they would be attacked actually by the protect the statues. <laughs> so it was a very strange atmosphere. And actually what, what really ended up was it was just a, a lot of people went there to fight the police. That's what it, that's what it became. And it was quite an ugly atmosphere. But um, yes, it, it came very quickly. It became part of the, the ongoing culture war. And uh, 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 in some ways without, a, uh, without some kind of basic ground rules being established. I mean, it does seem to me that, that apart from a very, very, very few people, uh, you know, who are probably on the kind of, you know, borderline path pathology state, um, there isn't anybody who wants all statues to stay up forever. You know, we don't actually, you know, there's very few people who think, great, you know, there's this lovely statue of Hitler was put up in my local square in, you know, 1939. And I think it'd be a real shame to get rid of it because it would be destroying history. Um, so, you know, we're arguing not about whether uh, public sculpture is kind of inviolate. We're arguing about where you have where you draw the line and where on the spectrum um, uh, 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 offence happens or things should be moved. And yes. that's, what we're, that's what we're disagreeing with. It isn't a kind of, um, you know, we're not Trumpian here, I don't think. No, it's, it's what, yes, what is the shelf life of a statue? Do yeah. I, where is the law that once a statue goes up, it cannot be touched? Because if you think about the public realm in Britain, Buildings get knocked down all the time and buildings are places where yeah. people live and have, have their lives and love, love buildings and statues. Why is it that statues should be treated in such a special way? Um, maybe it's what they represent or there's this fear of iconoclasm in Britain. But yes, some statues just run out of their life, don't they really? Yeah. Because they're, they're meaningless after a while. The point oh. has been made. Well, and we've forgotten who they were, ironically, yeah. because a yeah. statue is meant to remind you who these people are. We but can just go back to our screen. We don't need the Gandhi up at the moment, if that's right. Thank you. It's, I mean, the kind of the big question that just simply seems to me to get in most of the discussion, not in the kind of discussion that people in Art UK are having, but in most of the public discussion about this, is that nobody really raises the question of what on earth we think these statues or other bits of public sculpture not necessarily figurative statues, yeah. what they're actually for. 
you know and there is a kind of uh, there's a sort of blanket assumption that we put up things to admire in the public realm and i'm not sure mm. we do on this or, or should I, I i have a few theories actually one i think is a, a sort of anxiety over forgetting about people or forgetting about moments in history and i think we're just about to come up to a massive moment of anxiety when the last surviving soldier from world war ii dies and i think that's that was whole whole captain tom thing there was that in with, contained within it actually and so you have to put up sculptures of people like keith park and bomber harris because otherwise we'll forget these people that's that's one thought i think not that we will ever because if you look at british tv every night there's something about the second world war on you'd think the second world war ended last week the way it's sort of obsessively recycled on television but I think there is something to do about anxiety and a, and a lot of the Confederate statues were put up way okay, after yeah. war as yeah. a sign of anxiety in the 20s yeah. when the civil rights, yeah. the early civil rights era and people felt threatened. So this is a sign of threat. Another on the opposite end of the spectrum for me is that they, statues should, be, should bring happiness and joy into the public realm. And I think, you know, some of my favorite statues are of comedians. Yeah. And what's interesting is the comedian statue. There's a, one of Ken Dodd in Liverpool, which was up when he was alive. Uh, there's Eric Morecambe. Who else is there? There's George Form, we I've seen. They're always on the ground level, so you can interact with them and you can have your photograph taken with them. And they're there to sort of animate the, the, the space around, but also to make you feel happy. And I think that's so, I mean, we maybe need a bit more joy in our public statues rather than these figures on plinths looking down upon us. But I. Uh, they challenge me, and I think productively. You know, I think that. Um, no, look, I am. I, I'm in a privileged position here, right? And you know, I, I am uh, not a person of colour looking at a slave trader. Um, yeah. And I, I totally see the, where the difference is, but I walk through those those stuffed shirt statues or military statues in the West End in London, most of whom I haven't, whose names mean nothing to me. And they remind me of all kinds of things about where I've come from and where I am. You know, I, you know, I go past and I want to put two fingers up at them and say, you know, you didn't think I should have the vote, did you? Well, sorry, got it. You know, they're, they're, they're part of a way in which I interact with the kinds of bits of history that I, I, I might choose not to remember. Now, yeah. as I say, you know, it's easy for me to say that. It's easy for me to say, you know, I can say up yours to these silly old stuffed shirts because you know, I'm in a rel relatively in a position of power. I won, you know, I, you know mm. they lost, I won. Um, but I, I think that the, the complexity of public memory can't come down to just, I mean, you know, I like seeing the idea of seeing people that make us laugh, but it, it, it can't come down just to seeing people we approve of um, no. in, our, in our public realm. But I think that then you look about how these statues are contextualized within the space, even what the text is, what, yeah. sur what surrounds them yeah. Yeah. and how they're spoken of in the text. And so you could totally change the meaning of a statue by having a text underneath that's critical yeah. of that person or questioning of what their deeds or what they got up to. And I think that would, for a lot of those statues, they probably need that. And I know the mayor at the moment in London has a, has a, a group of people looking at statues and trying to work mm. out what to do with them, not to take them down, but how to maybe adapt them, contextualize them. There's an amazing, some amazing pictures from Wilmington, Virginia. Yeah, let's, let's see these because I thought those this were very, is, um, very good. Beautiful reaction to something. This is uh, Robert E. Lee in Wilmington, Virginia. And he was basically, it was a, you know, defaced effectively, but appropriated, you could say. Yeah. And yeah. so his strength became his weakness. And you have these projections and there's graffiti all around him and placards. And I don't know what it's like now. And I don't even know if he's left, as it were, he's gone. But um, I felt that, you know, in the short term, at least, was a brilliant solution. Yeah. There's another image as well, which you could probably yeah. show, if that's all right, Michael, um, a kind of close up of it, um, more performative. There we go. There's this performative element to it, these yeah. two ballet dancers. 
And I just felt that was a really interesting use. And those characters were, were <clears throat> the higher the plinth, the more, the more uh, contentious the person often, I think. And the further high up, so you uh, to top them. And the further to fall. I mean, I think plinths yes. are extremely interesting because I, mean, I, I think it's, uh, if, if you look at what the British Museum have done with Hans Sloane, um, he was on a plinth. Actually, he was yeah. in a plinth in the Enlightenment Gallery, um, uh, and he was never looked at. I mean, because you know, in the British Museum, column plinths are ten a penny, uh, and mm. he was in the background. And the the consequence of moving him and contextualising him is that he's come into a case, um, but he's now noticeable. But he's noticeable within uh, the context of uh, the slave trade. Presumably with a text that explains this. With, with a lot of text and a lot of other um, images, um, with, yeah. with the, you know, the plans of the slave ships. Right. And, uh, you well, know, see, that's, that's the display, isn't it? That's, what's, that's why museums are so brilliant, is you can, have dif you can have difficult objects and difficult conversations in a relatively neutral setting. I mean, obviously there's, di mm. there's difficulty with museums now with some of the exhibits and some of the artifacts they have. But museums are brilliant places to put these figures, really. Um, See, that's but where we I'm don't we don't call it putting on a pedestal for nothing, do we? I mean, we we have that phrase <laughs> on pedestals. So we take it off the pedestal. It's but the reverse. We, yeah, but also, you know, the higher they go, the further they come down. Yeah. I, I I I sort of worry about that. I mean, I think that that museums have a, have an important role to play here, and you know, I'm biased because I'm part of the trustees of the British Museum, I think what they've done is excellent in recontextualizing Sloan. I do get more worried though when I hear people say, what should happen to him, right? Re referring to some guy who's, who we don't any longer want to see. And we say, put him in a museum, put him in a museum, as if kind of a museum was going to be um, our get out of jail free card for not destroying these guys, but putting them out of sight. And, Somehow, I mean, it's a bit like your Wilmington statue. I mean, I think there are there are many different ways forward here. But one of the things that we need to be working on is surely how they can be recontextualized in public. Because I think, of, you know, if I think of, you know, this is a totally sort of mythical invented example. But let's say we put the slave trader in the Museum of Slavery. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I don't imagine that most white supremacists decide of an afternoon on Sunday, you know, come on, Dolly, let's go and see the Museum of Slavery, shall we? So they, there's a kind of preaching to the converted that happens when if they stayed out there, we might have a, a, a debate involving more people and more shades of opinion. To have that debate, you need to literally have that statue have a debate with another statue. Yeah. I would argue you have to surround it with some maybe something contemporary, some other imagery, other sculptures of some description. You need to, to it, it might not just be text, it might have to be something else entirely that surrounds the person, the statue, let's say, whoever it is or whatever it is, to change the meaning of it. And I think, I think art can help with that. I think artists actually are, are very helpful in this context. Have you got any plans or even fantasies uh, about what you'd like to do with one? <laughs> Come on, <not> Jeremy. <laughs> necessarily with this, I'm thinking of, you know, I'm thinking about what happens after COVID, if there is an after COVID, but that's slightly different. That's not necessarily going to be statues because that's a collective effort of the nation in a way. There are individuals, but I think it's the collective effort. And how do you, how do you mark that? I've, I've, I've used this, I've said this before, but I do actually believe that the greatest war memorial for the Second World War was the NHS. Yeah. So indeed. if we can think of something on equivalent of that, not that I doubt it's gonna to happen to be honest, unfortunately, but something that's a thing rather than a person or something on a plinth, that would be more suitable or appropriate really. So I'm thinking about the future as I'm sure we all are and what life will be like after. But I'd, you know, I'd be quite interested in that sort of thing. I'm not. I'm not fishing around for work here because I know there's a lot of people here working museums and so on. <laughs> but I think you know, artists. Are, I think would enjoy the challenge of of that recontextualization. 
it seems to me that statues and, and sculpture are a, a tremendously kind of good material for that because of the sort of physical embodiment. I mean, nobody has got much worked up about the painting of the death of Colston in Bristol. And that's partly because it's a, I mean, it's partly because he's dying, <laughs> but it's partly because uh, it's a painting. You know, and there is something about the physicality, the three dimensionality, the kind of the idea of the, the body of the past kind of erupting into the public sphere, which makes sculpture much more pressing for us. Well, it almost makes the person immortal, doesn't it? Because there they are built out, you know, made of this very tough material that could last forever, presumably, even though it was yeah. the case. They're yeah. there and they're, and they're higher up than us. They're looking over us. The text, I'm, I'm sure, and I, I think they changed the text at some point, but the whole situation of it was, yeah, yeah, it's a kind of hierarchy in a way, isn't it? Literally yeah. and metaphorically. I mean, I'm interested to see what, what happened in Roman times with emperors when they, <laughs> yeah. they stopped being popular. Did they just get toppled or were they just taken away? Yeah, well, um, uh, Michael, we'll have to have my, uh, let's have my marble Roman statue. I'm glad you asked that, Jeremy, because, you know, I, I think that, this isn't our problem. I mean, I think that we're terrible presentists about this. And what you do with, with, with statues you don't want now has been a, you know, a cultural issue for, you know, for hundreds, thousands of years. You know, so it's not, we haven't just discovered there's a problem here. And I think it, it really is worth having a quick look at what other cultures did and the Romans are only just one of them but what you see uh, on the screen now is a, a sculpture portrait sculpture of the Emperor Vespasian who came to power at the end of 69 beginning of 70 CE um, after a civil war which had replaced Nero so Nero uh, is forced to suicide at the end of 68 uh, uh, you know a few, few short lived emperors in between and then Vespasian comes and here is a, a statue of Vespasian from the British Museum. It, it, if we could all get around it and look at it carefully, it wouldn't take us long to see that this sculpture of Vespasian has been, um, has got, had a longer history than it looks. And he has been, it seems, retooled and rechiseled from being a statue of Nero. So you start with the statue of Nero, uh, Nero falls, um, the new guy on the block after a slight intermezzo is Vespasian and you change the statue into uh, a statue of Vespasian. And there's, there's kind of all kinds of reasons for doing that. And I think, you know, simple cash is one of those reasons. You know, you've just, you've just invested a large amount of money in a marble portrait of Nero. You don't want it to go to waste, so you change it to Vespasian. But I think it's, in some ways, it's a Colston manoeuvre. You know, it is actually, it's, um, uh, it's the, uh, the obliteration. You can, you can change this guy. You can actually say, I don't want Nero now. I want Vespasian. And you can have him. I mean, more cynically, I think it's a, an indication, if you're a Roman, that, you know, one emperor is much like another and all you have to do is get your chisel out and uh, a morning's work and you can easily change one emperor into the next. But they're facing, at some level, our problem of what what you do with apparently time expired um, public sculpture um, and you know we're not the first no so there were reports of sculptures coming down when there's a new emperor and then another one coming up or just yeah. it's like this but, turnover basically yeah, they got it you know sometimes they pull them down and throw them in the river you know there's the coal there yeah. is the colston um you know other times they get the chisel out and say too good to waste um i'm going to turn him into a into a Vespasian instead of a Nero. It's funny, um, this is quite similar to an image that I took, I wish I could find it. I was in India a few years ago and I was at a museum in Calcutta and around the, I was just walking around the back of the museum and there was a line of basically imperial monuments that had been taken down and were just lined up. And there were a few of Queen Victoria with her face smashed in 
which has happened at some point. I don't know when, but it just reminded me of that yeah. one with the nose off. Yeah. They just quietly yeah. take it down because they've been attacked at some point, but yeah. they kept. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I do think that sort of more generally that um, we, we imagine that we're the first generation to face this. And in fact, you know, every, every generation has, I'm sure there are people listening will be able to, to comment later on, um, you know, putting people up in the public sphere is a, is a controversial maneuver, whatever. I know. And uh, there's a time problem. There's a political problem. Um, you know, it isn't self-evident, you know, who are the goodies and who are the baddies. No, it's risky. And it's all, it's like when you're on stage or if you're performing, you're once you're very powerful, but actually you're very vulnerable at the same yeah, time. That's... So you're opening yourself up to all sorts of problems potentially in the future, which is obviously has happened. Um, but I was wondering if there are any other examples from the ancient world of, you had another image. I was wondering what that one was. Oh, the was. other image was, um, should we have the bronze one? I mean, I think this is just a kind of um, a, a real irony, actually an irony of the politics of, of public statuary, that this is a, a head also in the British Museum and it was found um, in Sudan. Um, uh, in excavations in the early 20th century. And it was, it's a statue of the Emperor Augustus, uh, once the head of a full length bronze statue, we assume, um, which had been captured from Roman Egypt by um, a successful raid by the Kushite, um, the Meroitic kingdom of Kush, um, and taken off. Uh, they'd chopped the head off, took it to the city of Meroe and they buried it as a, kind, as a, as a trophy uh, underneath the steps of their temple. And ironically, the only reason that, you know, this is one of the finest statues of the Emperor Augustus to survive anywhere in the world. The only reason it survives is it actually was looted by the Kushites and buried. Um, you know, and they were protesting the um, the imperial regime that this guy represented. The irony is, it's of course excavated and taken back originally to Liverpool by uh, an absolutely classic team of imperialist British archaeologists um, who find the relics of the Roman Empire underneath the steps of the Kushite temple and take it back to the UK. And it, it, I, mean, I think he's a very nice story of the sort of long-term complexities of, yeah. um, of damage, of preservation, but also politics that you yeah. see in this, and which we'll see in, in Colston, in fact. You know, and yeah. It's not a straightforward journey in a sense, is it, for a lot of these sculptures, uh, these statues. I was just wondering if, if this might not have happened, but let's say there's a statue of an emperor in a far-flung part of the Roman Empire, and then there's a new emperor, would they just put the name of a new emperor under That's, the statue of the old one? That is another little strategy they have. You just put a new label on it. Nobody knows. Nobody knows what they look yes. like. You just put a new label, um, and you know, simple, isn't it? And and we, you know, I I think in a way we're a bit too hung up about statues' identity. That um, that people in the ancient world. Certainly, in part, they're very happy with changing heads. Um, you know, not just re-sculpting, but you know, here's a lovely statue of Alexander the Great. I'm going to put Julius Caesar's head on it. That works brilliantly. And actually, kind of seeing, and I think you see, this is where I think you're very interesting. I want to ask you about this because that they are seeing, albeit in marble and in bronze, they are seeing portrait sculpture as a work in progress. They don't, you know, we have kind of got this idea that somehow it's, it's fixed and there forever. Because what you do with you know, including real people is actually animate and change that. Well, yes, I've actually, could we have the image that says we're here? It's the first one. I might just talk about this because I was, you know, in 2014, I was asked to think about the Somme and how to commemorate the Somme. And I thought it had to be 
what I didn't want to do was create a sculpture, basically, yeah. that people went to, or a, a, a traditional war memorial. So I just thought the idea of like human, because so many people have died that day, I just thought that the idea of like human bodies was very important. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it, was a, it was a kinetic artwork, unannounced, but traveled through Britain, but it was using people. And they looked, they didn't look really like statues, but they were quite still some of the time, but they were moving as well. And it was just a way to get around the, the traditional war memorial, basically, which is a place you go to, you take a pilgrimage to, and then you feel sad, and then you leave. And this was actually a place where, that actually would intervene in your life. You didn't have to go to it because it would come to you, effectively. And um, that's, a, that's obviously a still from it. And also as a way to intervene into everyday life in the way that a lot of statues do. They don't, you know, the surroundings change for statues when they go up. 200 years ago and it's unrecognizable where they are we're yeah. here these men are unrecognizable in in modern britain yeah it's a, not a modern britain anyone in 1916 would have understood at all it was a, you know, it's a totally alien environment to them and so there's that kind of uh, visual uh, jolt i would call it um but uh, Yes, but that was only there for one day, you see. It wasn't right. going to be a permanent memorial. Yeah. Even though it cost as much as a permanent memorial <laughs> to do. It was, it was just for a day. But it's a memorial on people's Facebook pages and Twitter and Instagram. You know, it, it's part of the national memory, basically, but it doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. But when you see the still, you do do the double take between what might be a, an inanimate statue and what is a living human body? I mean, so it plays with, it plays with the kind of corporeality of of, of the statue. I think quite yes, effectively. And, and we know how good actually a lot of First World War memorials are in terms of their depiction of of the soldiers. They're quite realistic. They're not particularly heroic. A lot of them. They're retired men, aren't they? Yeah. They have a Jagger Jagger statues. There's one in Paddington Station, which is amazing, and it's called the Letter Home or something. But so I, I, I definitely had those statues, those memorials in mind, but I wanted to make it uh, kinetic, basically. I wanted it to travel like yeah. a virus around Britain. Yeah. Do you think that we're actually, if you think of the, the relatively traditional uh, framework of, you know, a, a full length human sized or bigger than human sized um, figure in, bronze or marble in a public place. Do you think, how good are we at doing that now? I mean, we can all think of some truly ghastly examples yes. of this. Yeah, well, well, we, we both uh, talked about some pancreas station. station <laughs> yes. A national scandal. Yes. <laughs> I would say. Yes. I think the bigger that, you know, the bigger the thing for me, the higher the plinth and the more outsized the figure is, shows a lack of confidence. It shows a lack of confidence in the subject and, and what you're doing. So the Keith Park one, for example, is up. You know, Boris wanted that on the fourth plinth forever, and it didn't go, but it did go up for six months. And right. that is actually around the corner and near the Athenaeum Club, and he's one and a half times life size, I think. Uh, so they're bad. You know, it's bad. There's a very good one in Birmingham outside the library by Gillian Waring, the artist who did the um, the Melissa Fawcett. Fawcett. She did one of a family, a typical family from Birmingham and they're just walking and they're ground level. So there are some examples. I mean, I'll go back to the ones of the comedians, which I do like, actually, but you didn't, see, you didn't seem that interested in, but I do like some of those. And even some of the pop star ones, you know, there's something about them, but you know, there's a kitsch element, so it's, it can go very badly wrong. But I think there are some good examples of artists working. It's very difficult though, isn't it? I mean, Mark Wallinger did a very good piece for the fourth plinth with Eke Homo, I thought. Yeah. Um, but I think the life-size ones are the best, really. Yeah. I think they're the most touching. Do, do you think that the fourth plinth has been a really successful innovation then? Well, I'm, I have to admit, I'm on the, one of the committee for the fourth plinth. <laughs> so you've got to say yes. <laughs> so I, I think it's amazing. But um, you don't often get your, you don't always get your way on the panel because there's so many people on the panel that you can easily not get your way, which is very irritating. I'm sure some people here on the fourth panel watching this. <laughs> but I have to say, what I loved about the one at the moment, the ice cream with the 
with the cherry and stuff is that it's in the background of all these demos about um, anti -va anti vaxxers yeah. demos and anti mask ones, all yeah. these conspiracy theorists. So you see all these conspiracy theorists in the background. There's a giant ice cream. <laughs> it's just like I'm sure people are looking at those around the world, thinking, "What is that? What is going on there? What is that giant ice cream <laughs> with these strange theories?" So actually, I really, I really like the one at the moment. And there's a drone on it as well, which must get people very excited. But I think the fourth plinth, because it's revolving, you know, if you don't like it, it'll be gone in six months or a but year. It, it's also, I think, a, a justification of uh, art in public rather than even in a museum or gallery, because you find people commenting and discussing the stuff on the fourth plinth, you know, actually in Trafalgar Square or as they pass or in the newspaper, in a way that if they went into a gallery, they would say, well, that's a load of rubbish or, you know, well, but it's somehow because it's outside, because it's part of us, yes. you can you can respond to it without um, without falling into the stereotypes of how I'm now going to respond to a work of art. It, so it's, it kind of, it really justifies being in the open air, I think. And it justifies the idea that not all sculptures should be permanent. Yeah. And also yeah. if they are, sometimes when sculptures are permanent, they actually become invisible. Yeah. I couldn't tell you who else is in Trafalgar Square. It's men on horses mainly, I think, but yeah. I have no idea who they are. But you would do, you always remember the fourth plinth works. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually a very good model, I think, uh, for this. But it, and it gets the conversation going. I, th I just think I think it's been pretty successful yeah. on that. Yeah. Weirdly, so, though, there's been very, very few of late, uh, very few depictions of humans, as yeah, in no, statues. Right. Yeah, they're mostly other things. Yeah, yeah, different kinds of installation. Can mm. I just finish by asking you to to kind of do a bit of forward prediction? Um, about where you think, where we think we're going with this, um, whether whether the the statue wars will kind of fade because well, they'll burn out, or whether there really is going to be a change about in what we see in public. I mean, I hope the statue wars burn out. I hope the discussion around statues doesn't burn out. And I hope it's still an energetic discussion, but not a nasty, divisive one. Yeah. Because I think public space post COVID, you know, whenever that is, it's going to be so important for people yeah. to come and heal themselves almost. But we need public spaces just to be in and to just be around other other people, other kinds of people even. But I, I hope that it's the discussion itself can be very healthy. And I think it's been great for museums and it's great for visual culture that, that statues and art and and memorials and really being thought about and and discussed yeah. so I, i'm trying to be hopeful but with the current government it's difficult sometimes i have to say <laughs> thank you really jeremy that. <laughs> and you. on that tactful note we're, uh, we'll <laughs> hand back to andy <laughs> uh mary and jeremy that was absolutely brilliant you need to sort of imagine uh, very loud applause around the country. So thank you so much. Yeah, so we're, let's... Yeah, we're trying. <laughs> so let's move on to some questions. We've had quite a few questions, although I have to say a number of these are, are, are comments. Um, let's start with, I mean, you talked about shelf life of public monuments and sculptures. So the question is, who decides on the shelf life of a public sculpture and monument? Well, we saw one answer to that in Colston, didn't we? Yes. We saw, uh, uh, and actually we, we saw in the background to that, um, a local governmental community that had failed to de decide, you know, that you know, after, there'd been lots of initiatives lots of discussions about how you might change the information etc nothing had happened and it was uh, you know part of the reason that it was exciting i think is it did it did appear from the outside at least to be people saying we've had enough of this um uh, and you've had your chance we're deciding uh, yes because there was a process going on wasn't there mm. 
And I suspect the mayor of Bristol was actually quite happy it happened, even though he could not say that because yeah. they actually done, done what they basically had wanted. Yeah. Um, who decides about other statues? I mean, yes, that's the public deciding, um, but then I don't know. It's just when you think of something better to go in that place or someone more apt to go in that place when there's a replacement, maybe. Maybe there should be a curator of public statues like there are in museums. Because no, no paintings in museums stay up forever, even though we might think they do. I'm sure they've all been rotated in their times and yeah. some are very popular and then they become very unpopular for whatever reason. Yeah. So there might have to be some sort of curator, yeah. another curator doing <laughs> this. I know, also, I think, thinking about where they... I mean, there's... You know, we tend people tend to talk about it in terms of the polarity between either being up in the place he's always been and it's usually he um or in the museum but oh you were mentioning jeremy the idea of um putting them into new configurations putting a diff somebody different next to somebody else and then they start talking to each other in an entirely new way um and i, I think there is you know there, there are all kinds of shades in between tear them down and leave him up I mean, we are. There is a problem of, of money as well. These things cost a lot of money, and we know that councils are going to be very, very strapped for cash. So I, I don't know if, unfortunately, I don't know if these things are going to happen. But yeah, I think there's creative solutions to these knotty problems. And related to that is a, a question around: Is the waiting there on the the, the the local people or the general public at large across the UK, or indeed? committees it depends i think each statue each sculpture has its own constituency and has people that was very personal to the people of bristol yeah. very personal and um because so much is named after him and he's such a big personality if i can call it that a big historical figure in the town and i think bristol took that one very personally in terms of him being there yeah. But, you know, there's national figures and there's local figures and all sorts of, I think every, every statue has its own sort of problems potentially and its own audiences, local, national, international. I, I felt that very much about uh, the, uh, the Good War Memorial in Cambridge, which was a few years ago moved from the middle of the road to a kind of a little constructed park at the side of the road, about, about which I felt rather sad. The council said um, that the war memorial, who's a, a, a soldier looking up towards the station, um, he was holding up the traffic. And I thought, that's the point. <laughs> that is the bloody point. You know, we are going to remember these people who died because they hold up the traffic. You know, the idea of saying, oh, you know, we, we don't mind having him somewhere near, but not really getting in the way, um, I thought was another interesting, um, you know, version of, of who decides and what your priorities are. There's um, an interest, I think, from our guests in um, how in the future sculpture commemorates the present rather than the past. And I, I was wondering whether you know, given this intense interest in in public sculpture at the moment, um, well, this will spawn a sort of golden age in terms of the creation of public sculpture in the years to come. Do you think they're connected? You'd hope so, wouldn't you? You can always be hopeful. <laughs> I mean, it's quite interesting. We haven't talked about blue plaques, which are in, in, no, in I was going to Yes, I was going to mention that is exactly. They, yeah. I love that system, but, but also they, often wait 20 years after someone's death, I believe, or 25 years, just to make sure there's no skeletons in cupboards and so on, so they can sort of be sure about the person that they're commemorating. But that's a slightly different issue. But I think that I, I'd like to think because there's been so much discussion and because contemporary art in Britain is part of the national conversation, quite amazingly, I think, on the whole, people know about it and talk about it and aware of it. But I'd like to think we, there would be commemorative, good commemorations of this moment or in, in some way. Yeah. But like I said, councils are so poor at the moment, they're just going to yeah. get poorer and poorer, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how they're going to do it. And I, I think that there's much more public desire for it than you would 
imagine if you read a certain section of the British press, you know, mm. wanting to tell you that it's all far too expensive and, you know, it's just, you know, um, icing on the cake. And I think you can see that from, um, you know, whatever you think of it, the Angel of the North did something to that, to that landscape and to people's engagement with a figure uh, in, in the landscape. Yeah. Um, and the, we're very bad at talking about those kind of those interventions in the public sphere, artistic interventions that that have really bedded down successfully. Um, we talk about the ones that that we don't like or appear to be disruptive, um, mm -hmm. and I think there's a, a, a lot more public desire for. Um, for public art than you would guess from reading the tabloids. Yeah, even if the public don't, maybe don't see it as art necessarily, no. but as a, as, a, as, a, as good landscaping or a yes. children's yes. playground or That's something right. yes. that an That's artist right. has made or has an artistic yeah. intent, yeah. Um, but has within its, is, is loved by the public. I mean, in terms of statues is different because almost you have to, the whole country, or well, a lot of people have to agree upon this person, whoever this person is. I can think of a few, but there will be statues too. Uh, but I don't want to even want to think about certain people dying in our public life and then having statues. But um, I mean, there's a Margaret Thatcher statue going up in Grantham. Yeah, we didn't need yeah. to talk about that, uh, which is kind of interesting that she's been sort of re rehabilitated, but it's very, it's super local, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Super local. I mean, I don't wonder if ever your time when you could have a Margaret Thatcher, st Thatcher statue in London or in, you know, in Parliament Square. Well, uh, only if you break the assumption that they're celebratory, not commemorative. Yeah, which is very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> very difficult. You know, I, I, you know, I've been working recently on st modern statues of Roman emperors. Uh, you know, and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of them um, uh, and they were not put on display because people thought they were nice guys you know everybody knew they were murderous psychopaths you know so there was the the, well, the, 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 the the what those statues were doing in the field of vision was more complicated than saying they're things that they're people we want to admire now yes all, I think yeah. Because there, they didn't have, they would, they didn't make documentaries about these people. They didn't have social media or newspapers. So that was the only way to know about someone was through a statue, maybe, or yes. for the public to be warned about someone through a statue. Whereas we have other means to yes, I think communicate true. someone's life. Yes. Uh, so now statues actually their meaning has become reduced in that. If you, yeah. if, if yes. I'm correct in what you're saying, to the point where they are basically to praise someone. Yes. More or less, I'm, I'm, not I'm, as a warning. You know. No, no. I, you know, I, I like the, I, I like the kind of bifocality of it, really. That, um, that they, they might praise, they might warn, or they might be somewhere in between. You know, they might yeah. be, you know, warnings of some things, um, but celebrations of others. And I don't know if it would be possible to have that currently. And if we're talking about, let's say, for example, Margaret Thatcher, I think it's very difficult for the public to get, or the press at least, to get their heads around as the subtlety of, of that in a public sculpture, a statue of someone. There are a few questions on commissioning um, public sculpture. And you know, we've talked already about um, public sector cuts and likely public sector austerity in, in the future. So the, the dependence on private funders for public sculptures will, will, will grow. Is that something that concerns you? Well, it depends who they are, doesn't it, really? <laughs> yeah. people are. I think Keith Park, going back to Keith Park, I think he probably was private money. I'm, I, I suspect Margaret Thatcher might have been. Yeah. Uh, that's how it was in the past, though, wasn't it? That's yeah. why the, uh, there's a fourth plinth that's empty on Trafalgar Square, yeah. because not enough money was, was raised yes. for a king yeah. whose name I don't even know who was, one of the Georges, I think. Yeah. So that's the traditional route, but it does mean that certain people can uh, throw their money around and uh, demand something, a statue of whoever, 
um, Anne Rand, for example, or someone like that, because they have the money and they can have one, put one up or whoever, you know. Um, I'd much prefer if it was crowdfunded and everyone gave 10 mm. quid rather than three people gave yeah. 300,000 pounds or something. I think that would be a democratic way of doing it, if you can call it that subscription model. There's a, a question about, are we only concerned about figurative statues dedicated to someone or would an abstract statue also be problematic? So perhaps we throw that to you. Mary? Oh, speak? well, I mean, look at, look at um, Maggie Hamling um, and Mary on the Green recently, which um, is, uh, you know, another, uh, another work of art which has caused uh, a huge amount of, um, of, of controversy. And indeed, we've um, had a number of questions about that to you both, so... You know, and I think that, I mean, I, 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 you know, Jeremy's in the business and I'm just in the business of, of looking at this kind of stuff, but um, I, I feel terribly strongly that um, I, I want st statues to um, shape me up a bit. I, I, you know, I, I want to walk past something and um, feel um, challenged by it. And I think it's very easy to assume that all these, you know, guys in their military uniform, you know, put up in the 1880s or whenever, were, were never challenging. Well, I bet some of them bloody well were, you know. Um, but we we've simply kind of lost the resonance so that we think of them as just a load of dead white European males. Um, and I, I think it's, you know, Jeremy took and I quite agree, you know, saying that it'd be nice for the um, the public sphere to be more fun and there to be more humour and more funnier. You know, I, I'd like there to be kind of more, uh, a bit more frisson, a bit more um, excitement, a bit more, oh my God, in it. And I don't mind really whether that's, you know, figurative or abstract, I, I, I don't care. Um, and I, I, I particularly dislike our assumption, this is going back to what I said before, I guess, you know, that that somehow, you know, we're the first people to realise that these sculptures might be difficult. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, they've always been damn difficult, you know, whether it's a choice of whom, whether it's public subscription, you know, or whatever. I like the idea of frisson and fun. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily in the same thing, but, you know, a bit of fun and frisson sounds good. Um, the problem with me, well, the Mary on the Green and Mary Wollstonecraft sculpture the real problem for me and it's something we've already talked about today is that there's nothing about who she was on, on there's no text no, about her right. no. i think there might be a that's quote right. by her yeah, there's actually right. no text so you're yeah. seeing this quite strange sculpture let's face it it's, is it a statue is it a sculpture i mean it's quite an interesting hybrid yeah. in a way but and people have uh, interacted with it by putting clothes on her which yeah. i quite like right. Right. But there's nothing about who she was and what she achieved in her life and why she's there, really. Yeah. And that to me yeah. seems a massive yeah. error, really, because yeah. there's a, plenty of space on that plinth to write, yeah. to explain it. And if it was explained better or yeah. at all, I think yeah. people might have a different view of it. Yeah. But, but it is quite an odd intervention in that space, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. There's one final question, which is, if in 20 years time we were having this conversation, how different would it be then than it is today? <laughs> um, I, if I was going to um, go for an honest prediction, I think that the basic coordinates of the discussion would be the same, because I think the basic coordinates of the discussion about who's allowed to do what in public, with what kind of intervention, about whom are the basic questions. And they've been basic questions for hundreds of years. And we, the, the modality of the answer changes slightly, um, but you can't get away from the fact that who you decide to put up or what you decide to put up in your central city space. Now, we might be dealing with a world in which central city space means something very different. Um, post-COVID, but uh, as we can still reasonably foresee, the, 
the bottom line of the question is going to be the same. We might be I, better at answering it. I agree. I think we will still be discussing certain people that should or shouldn't go up and uh, the nature of public space. I don't think things are going to change that and who's been rehabilitated and who hasn't been. Uh, but I hope it's, you know, it's a mature discussion at least, but um, we'll see, won't we? And one that doesn't simply divide people into heroes and villains. You know, we're trying to get rid of that in the school curriculum. You know, that you know, Francis Drake was both a great explorer and a criminal pirate at the same time. Um, and, and we want some, some of the sophistication of the discussions we're trying to have about uh, in the literary realm. Uh, we want that to be... Um, uh, to be something we can do with visual arts constructively and directly and with graffiti and pots of paint and whatever. I'm all fine with that. It's, um, it, it's just kind of sanctimonious self-righteousness I don't like. I think complexity is fine. I think it's good. But um, we're not particularly well served by social media and the press in Britain when it comes to these discussions. And I think they no. make no. it more crude, yes. frankly. And yeah. that doesn't help. Because I'm sure if you had the artist or a historian speaking about the person, it would make things a lot easier, but unfortunately it gets filtered through other means. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. It has just gone seven o'clock um, from all of my colleagues at Art UK and all of our guests um, around the world. An enormous thank you to Jeremy Diller, to Mary Beard. Um, it's been an enormous pleasure. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. See you. <laughs> bye bye. A big thank you also to my colleagues who have arranged this two day conference and um, who have been behind the scenes working tonight on making this go smoothly. Thank you very much to them. Uh, the conference continues tomorrow with a number of fascinating uh, sessions. Um, in the morning on recent sculptural research and discoveries, colonial sculptures in a post-colonial world, and a big focus on learning activities around sculpture in the afternoon. Um, and finally, um, a few years ago, we, we, we surveyed the users of Art UK and discovered that um, only half of them knew that we were a charity. Um, when we did that a few months ago, we discovered that two thirds of them knew that we were a charity. I think everyone on this call probably does know that we're a charity. And so if I can remind you, if you would like to support us, please come to our site and um, make a donation or become an Art UK citizen. It would be wonderful if you would do that. So thank you very much for joining us tonight and good night to you from all of us at Art UK. Thanks, Andrew.